Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as an old friend of India. He was awarded a Padma Bhushan by the Government of India and a knighthood by the Government of the United Kingdom. He has worked for 22 years as a correspondent for the BBC and has written several books on India, the most recent India's Unending Journey. I'm delighted to welcome Mark Tully. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, much of the book, the sort of the key, uh, sort of the image, the idea, the motif of the book is really about balance. Yes. Uh, and I think that at, 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 at this time in the, in the seeming uh, chaos of India, um, there is a, 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 a common perception, a feeling of fear that maybe we're losing our balance mm, mm, uh, after yes. sort of, you know, a, a civilization that has survived for centuries. Mm. You've talked about how Varanasi mm. is perhaps the only city in the world that has retained much of its original culture. Yes, yes. What reassures you that we still have elements of balance in India? Well, I'm not sure that I am reassured, <laughs> actually, <laughs> about it. Um, uh, I, you know, when, when, when I was writing this book, um, it arose really out of my concern that not just in India, uh, but in the West very much, and particularly in my own country of Britain, we do not have this sense of balance. And we go from one extreme to another extreme. And I think in India, if you want to look at India now, there is one extreme uh, which you really are in danger of going from. You go from the extreme of socialism with all the problems of the license permit Raj, all the corruption that generated, all the hindrance to people's initiative, and then you come to a form of capitalism where India really seems to be saying that businessmen are the only people who know how to do anything mm -hmm. and let's hand the whole country over to the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, and surely the balanced way means to find what's good in socialism, find what's good in market capitalism, mm -hmm. and try and find a middle way between the two. Mm -hmm. So in what ways would you, would you marry these? What well, I think of, What are some of the elements? Well, I think the first thing I would do is that I would uh, stop this concentration on GDP, on growth, because it's a very narrow definition. And you know, as I say in the book, if uh, I was told this when I went to Ireland, which is part of the book, uh, that uh, if you measure GDP, you get, uh, you get all sorts of absurd things. You find that a woman um, who goes out to work and the government has to supply a carer to look after her children is helping the economy because there are two incomes coming in. But a woman who stays at home and looks after her children mm -hmm. is theoretically a hindrance. Mm -hmm. And the Irish economist even said to me that an oil slick mm -hmm. is good for the GDP mm -hmm. because it generates the economic activity of mm -hmm. clearing up the mm -hmm. oil slick. Well, at, at, at some points in your book, you, you, you talk about, in a sense, the perils of efficiency. That uh, seems a, a, a dichotomy. <laughs> 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 well, I, I don't, th you know, I, I, I think it's a very interesting point, this efficiency one. Of course, it's one which I uh -huh. rather hung myself on when I, uh -huh. uh, uh, when I was last days of my time in the BBC, mm -hmm. I made a speech condemning the uh, form of efficiency which was being imposed on the BBC, mm -hmm. and as a, as a result had to leave. Well, we'll come but to that in uh, a moment, but that is, that, that seems to be something you haven't quite gotten over because it, it, it sort of keeps coming up in your writings. But let's stay with the efficiency yeah, for now. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well um, no, what, what I mean by efficiency is the very narrow definition of efficiency. If efficiency really comes down to nothing more than doing things as cheaply as you possibly can, uh, which in a way it is all about. What do people say? They take over a company and they say, we're going to cut costs. There are other things to be considered. And you might even find that actually you are cutting costs if, for instance, you say that 
we must not be so concentrated on this narrow form of, in of efficiency that we totally destroy staff morale, we treat staff as though they were machines. If you were to say, let us concentrate quite a lot of our energy on staff morale, you might well find that through concentrating on staff morale, you actually get a better result than by cost cutting, threatening people with job losses, and all the rest of it. Well, I think one thing that, 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 I that emerges is that, that perhaps uh, efficiency is cold, it's impersonal, it doesn't have uh, character, uh, and, and inefficiency and, 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 and some, some degree of inefficiency and chaos uh, you know, adds to the, to the richness, the texture of life. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, you know right. <laughs> one thing's in this book, it's, the book is about balance. Uh, and so I'm not condemning sure. efficiency Obviously. absolutely and saying Obviously. we shouldn't indeed. be efficient, indeed. nor am I indeed. praising inefficiency. Indeed. Indeed. And we all know in our lives, we can remember, you and I can remember the days when India was a phenomenally inefficient country when you know you couldn't get a railway ticket hardly in this country. Now nobody wants to go back to that sort of inefficiency. Well you know you talk about the railways with great love and, and yes. railways are a personal passion, Absolute uh, passion. of yours. Yes, yes, and, yes. And, and, and you know you talk about the middle path mm. as, 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 as mm. being the great inheritance perhaps uh, as a phrase if, if not the mm. idea certainly from the Buddha. Yes. And how that the railways are the perfect illustration mm. of the middle path. Mm. Mm. Well, <laughs> in a way, I think the railways are the perfect illustration of the middle path. Well, for two ways, of course, because they are on the middle path, in a way. And if they stray to the left or right, they fall off the middle path. But also, I think, you see, one of the things I think about the railways, which shows they're the middle path, is because um, they are um, the, in my view, most effective form of mass transport for the general public. And they're on the middle path because they represent public transport. And they represent the difference, or they represent rather what we should be thinking about with the motor car. We should be thinking that our attitude to the motor car has become unbalanced. There are far too many cars on the road already, and they're going to get more and more if the transport policy pursued by the government is so oriented towards the road. So what is the middle path you try and bring people back to? You'd spend lots and lots of money on your railways. You make them much faster, uh, more efficient, although I love them mm -hmm. as they are now, I have mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. But you can make them a lot faster, a lot more efficient. And then you get back into the middle path where public transport um, actually is a form of transport which is for the public good. Mm -hmm. Motor car is a form of transport which is for the private good. You know, there is, there are so many elements of, 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 of spiritual insight of spiritual engaging and, um, and, and in many ways I have to say that I envy you that uh, you know, after your stint as a news correspondent with the BBC your professional life has been able to parallel your personal journey and you have been able to do programs like Something Understood on the BBC radio and, and write books that articulate that internal process. Uh, in what ways uh, has it wasn't really an accident, was it? Your posting in India uh, catalyzed this. Have you ever thought of what your life might have turned out like if you were posted to Washington or Paris? I, you know, I've, o <laughs> I've often thought about that, <laughs> often. And I have been and remain intensely happy that that didn't happen and that I stayed in India. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we were talking about balance, one of the things which uh, my career in India has taught me so much of it has been due to things other than myself. Mm -hmm. um, I am Mark Talley for a whole lot of factors which have come about. Uh, and in the book I talk about someone who says, uh, a Methodist uh, preacher who says we are 90% fate and 10% free will. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that getting the balance between free will and fate and accepting that we are not wonderful, we are not uh, you know, what books I've written, so much has been given to me to write of. It's not me being so wonderful, you know. Um, I, I do believe that, and of course, that is brought home to me by mm -hmm. the fact that it was fate which brought me to India where I was born here, mm -hmm. fate which brought me back again, and fate which on two other occasions at least allowed mm -hmm. me to stay here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, the railways, 
uh, there is so much of the, 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 the romantic in you that even when you're sort of referring to the values of inefficiency, shall I say, uh, you know, the, your, your book is full of these wonderful anecdotes. You know, a, a, a train is late and it's, uh, and you're told that it's, uh, uh, what, uh, I forget the phrase, but it's sort of eternally Indefinite late, delayed. indefinitely delayed. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and another train arrives, <laughs> and you see value in that. It creates an opportunity for you to chat, to, to engage <laughs> in conversation with other people uh, on the train. <laughs> and I think what comes out in, in your writing is this amazing ability to savor life, uh, even in what would appear to be um, the most ordinary of circumstances, or, or sometimes for most people, a very frustrating experience. Well, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that, and I do get frustrated, I can assure you, especially when driving on the roads of Delhi, I get frustrated. But I, uh, um, I, I do believe uh, that uh, in as far as it is absolutely possible, one thing you should reject in life is anger and mm. impatience. Mm. Uh, I don't succeed by any means, mm. always. Mm. But um, if, you th if you do reject anger and impatience, then when you get situations where you are faced with problems, uh, you don't get uh, mm. angry about it, you don't get impatient. Mm. Mm. Um, and I suppose also partly because of my love of railways, I don't really mind hanging around railway stations <laughs> anyhow. Um, mm -hmm. But I do get angry. So, but only the other day I'd written a very angry letter to an airline because mm -hmm. of some awful things which happened uh, on a flight. Mm -hmm. a minor things in a way, mm -hmm. but I was angry. So I, I don't always succeed mm -hmm. in containing this anger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, the passions staying with the railways for you is, is the, uh, the railways uh, in around Darjeeling. Oh, yes. Yeah. What's so special about the railways in Darjeeling that they should so capture your <laughs> well, energy and there are, <laughs> attention? There are, two very, there are two very practical <laughs> things about it. Okay. One is that my father was a director of that railway, ah. and the other was that that <laughs> railway took me to my first school in Darjeeling. Okay. So I have these nostalgic <laughs> memories of it. Uh -huh. But it is also a very beautiful and a very unique railway, and a railway where steam engines over a hundred years old are still running. Mm -hmm. So it's personal and also aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But beyond, beyond this sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of sense of nostalgia, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you have again eloquently talked about the, the, the practical aspects of you know, how the railways uh, uh, can, can serve an important purpose of conserving the environment, of creating community, of efficiency, and a whole range mm. of uh, uh, issues that uh, circumscribe that. Uh, as, 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 as a correspondent, you have traveled extensively around India. Mm. You, have, uh, you have talked about Varanasi, mm. the charm of Varanasi. Mm. 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 What is the charm of Varanasi for you? For most, well, most people mm. in India still mm. see it as this sort of great, uh, great ancient city and, 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 and keep praying that you know, the, the roads would be cleaned and that uh, it, 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 it would in some ways at least get its act together. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I think um, Varanasi, there's a mahal, there's an atmosphere about it to start off with. There is the, when you understand that there is a culture here which is being preserved, which has lasted all these many, many years, that in a sense gives but you But it sense. isn't consciously being preserved. It's it's no, but that's, it the, but that's the important thing about mm -hmm. it. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, a culture which is consciously mm -hmm. uh, preserved can become rather pretentious mm -hmm. or precious. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not pretentious or precious. Mm -hmm. um, the ghats are very beautiful and, you know, going down mm -hmm. the ghat on, uh, on a, um, uh, early in the morning or late at night is uh, mm -hmm. very beautiful. There are great people to talk to in Varanasi mm -hmm. as well. You know, in the last chapter of my book, mm -hmm. I talked to a wonderful um, mm -hmm. Mahant, the Maha, mm -hmm. my, my friend Mahant Birvadra of the Hanuman uh, mm -hmm. Motran temple there. Mm -hmm. I talked to the head of a Mutt there. Mm -hmm. I talked to a very profound Muslim there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. There are these people to talk to. BHU is a wonderful compound. Mm -hmm. so but, uh, but in, in its totality, what does Varanasi teach you? What do you learn from it? In what ways does it well touch you and move you? In it, you know, apart from in the, its the totality, in its totality, it uh, appeals to my innate 
conservatism and by nature I am a mm -hmm. conservative of a small c in that this culture has been preserved there and it encourages me to believe that with all the change and things going on much of which I do I would have to admit I find depressing change mm -hmm. which goes too fast mm -hmm. that something uh, mm -hmm. will survive all mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and it it symbolizes for me another of these balance mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. the balance between tradition and change. Mm -hmm. Because I believe a healthy society mm -hmm. has to be a society where there is what I would call a, a tension mm -hmm. between change and tradition, mm -hmm. and where people don't simply chuck babies in uh, out with the bathwater all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And Varanasi symbolizes that. This uh, the case that you, you, you make uh, you know, throughout the book and in much of your writings and, and, and No Full Stops for India and, and in, in your other earlier works has been really a case uh, for the spirit, for the spiritual mm. to coexist mm. uh, in, in harmony mm. with mm. the material. Mm. Mm. In terms of your own spiritual quest, mm. Mm. is this sort of the Gyan yog that you you know you learn you read you meet people and you internalize and you understand and you're transformed by it do you have a a, a sadhana of some kind uh, you've described yourself as you know that, uh, that you continue to be a, a Christian at yes. least in the formal yeah. sense yeah. so tell us about this 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 process of internalizing the spirit I mean is there do you follow any of the traditional Indian practices techniques no, basically my practices are, are Christian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, I go to church, I'm not a, as regular church goer as I should do, uh, but I, I, I read books, uh, Christian books. I, it all started for me with Christian priests. My tutor at Cambridge went on to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. And you almost he became a priest I did, until indeed, you fled. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a lot of India in it as well. Um, I, and for instance, in the book, I talk about the impression that Radhakrishnan's Hindu view of life made on me, just that very mm -hmm. small book. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do talk to and go to and meet mm -hmm. a lot of um, uh, Indian uh, Hindus, Muslims, Maulana mm -hmm. Wahyudadeen, who lives right opposite me, I've mm -hmm. been to see him, I've had long talks with him. So all these things come together and I see it really as, um, in a way you could say it's a Gyan Yoga in a way, because it's, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a disciplined one in a funny mm -hmm. sort of way, it's all sorts of things mm -hmm. coming in and trying to absorb them and uh, deal mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And the end result is, uh, not entirely satisfactory, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the book, you talk about uh, you know the struggles uh, with the BBC uh, in, in in being able to uh, get them to mainstream programming on spirituality and religion. That in 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 some ways that there's that there's almost an embarrassment uh, with the with with, with establishments to to embrace. Uh, religion and, and, and matters of the spirit. Mm. Uh, you also sort of, uh, in one of sort of the areas of your deep anguish, is how uh, misunderstood religion, uh, mm. and particularly mm. with, with in, 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 in terms of understanding global terrorism, mm. uh, is, is is something that aggravates mm. Uh, mm. global crises. Mm. Mm. Uh, in, in what ways would you like communities, societies, governments? Uh, to look at matters of faith? Well, you know, I just made three <laughs> small <laughs> films, uh, mm -hmm. one on Hinduism, one on Sikhism, one on Buddhism, mm -hmm. um, for the BBC, because the BBC itself is aware that its staff does need to understand and to know about religions. And one of the things which, uh, when I was making these films, and I was talking to the producer, she said was, we have to persuade people in the BBC that actually, millions and millions of people take religion very seriously. And I think this is one of the problems in the West, uh, particularly in Europe, not so much in America, of course, that uh, so many people are totally dismissive of religion now and think it's balmy, or even worse, there are many, many people mm -hmm. who think it's something uh, which mm -hmm. isn't quite 
respectable. Mm -hmm. um, and that I mean, that I think is, is what really concerns me. And I, mm -hmm. I don't, for the, la the last thing I would be, would be to go out and stand in Hyde Park or, <laughs> or on, the my, on the boat club lawn mm -hmm. and preach and tell people that they should all become Christians. It's not my belief that they should all become mm -hmm. Christians. It's not my belief that necessarily everyone is going to be religious. But it is my belief that there is a spiritual side in life. Mm -hmm. It's very important that there are some people who appreciate the spiritual life and write and talk about it. And mm -hmm. it's very important that those people who don't understand this uh, at least mm -hmm. show respect to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest seller in Britain, one of the biggest sellers is a book by Rob Richard Dawkins called uh, The God Delusion. Mm -hmm. And if you read what he says inside there, mm -hmm. you know, it is totally anti-religion. Mm -hmm. It is literally saying, if you believe, you are deluded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this mm -hmm. is what concerns me. Mm -hmm. Not that everyone mm -hmm. should believe, mm -hmm. but that there should be a proper space for the people who do believe. Mm -hmm. And why is that important, apart from one's own personal quest and the pursuit of happiness and in whatever ways you describe happiness? Uh, because one of the things you're exploring is, is why that is important that that should happen for society, for communities, for relationships between communities, relationships between nations, between civilizations? Well, there's one very clear <laughs> reason, which I think <laughs> I brought out why it's important. Mm -hmm. Because actually one thing that spirituality teaches you is humility. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that all religion, spirituality, is really in a way about curbing the ego, isn't mm -hmm. it? And what is curbing the ego is uh, mm -hmm. humility. Mm -hmm. And if we as societies and as individuals had a lot more humility, mm -hmm. we would not, to go back to balance, mm -hmm. keep on getting out of balance. Mm -hmm. And if you take one obvious example, mm -hmm. if we had had more humility mm -hmm. in our attitude to nature, if we had not thought that we are God virtually mm -hmm. and nature is there for us to do mm -hmm. what we want, mm -hmm. if we had had the humility to realize that we are as much a part of nature mm -hmm. as a dog, a cat, mm -hmm. a rose, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and that we are as dependent on nature as they are, mm -hmm. we would not be in the mess which we are now. Mm -hmm. So humility mm -hmm. is one of the great things which comes out of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And if there are enough people who just understand this, mm -hmm. struggle to be humble, I mean, in everything I say, mm -hmm. uh, I realize it's a huge struggle to do all these mm -hmm. things, you know. Mm -hmm. I believe in humility, but I'm often finding myself arrogant. Mm -hmm. But if you believe in it, at least sometimes you bring yourself back onto the middle road. Mm -hmm. And if there are enough people doing that, mm -hmm. then there will be a voice in society mm -hmm. against all the arrogance which mm -hmm. there is. Mm -hmm. Just look at the business community. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it require enormous arrogance mm -hmm. for someone to say that I'm worth 20 million pounds to this mm -hmm. company? Isn't that mm -hmm. an extraordinarily mm -hmm. arrogant thing to say? Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I touched on this uh, earlier on in our conversation, that I see that, that uh, you're, you're disengaging with the BBC <laughs> and, and, and the famous letter and communication uh, that, that, that you sent out. Uh, it's something that, that, that comes up, has, has come up a number of times. Is that something that still bothers you or do you feel complete uh, that it's over, it's done with and you've had a, you've had a new life after that? It's, uh, <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't uh, really bother me, except that, obviously, I am, uh, you know, there are people who don't understand why I did it, and so I'm quite anxious to make it clear why I did it. Mm -hmm. But I don't uh, regret it in that sense, um, because to me there are two or three things about what I believe in, basically, mm -hmm. which actually uh, are borne out in what I did. The first one is that, I only did this uh, because we who are opposed to this excessive managerial type culture um, were not uh, having a voice at all. Mm -hmm. And I had been asked to give a sort of quite prestigious lecture, although mm -hmm. in humility I shouldn't say <laughs> that, but it was quite <laughs> prestigious. And mm -hmm. I felt that this was a platform mm -hmm. uh, from which one of us could have a voice. So it was fate, not free will, that I did <laughs> that. That's one of the things I believe in. <laughs> then the other thing I believe in, you see, is that one of the burdens of my thing was that this, uh, what is happening in the BBC is doing exactly what I do not believe in, 
which is taking change far too far and ditching mm -hmm. a whole, you know, which you could say masses or tons, but ditching traditions, ditching any concern about ethos and trying to change the whole thing like that. Isn't, is, is, as, as, as a media person, uh, don't you despair that that is what is happening in India in, 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 in of course, on, on, on of course television? I <laughs> of course I despair about that. I absolutely, I do indeed, yes. Uh, and and uh, I, I, uh, I do think that um, all of us in the media actually need to, if we're going to say, as for instance, the media is now saying to the government of India, you can't control our content. Well, then you have got to say to yourselves, let us control our own content. Let us again bring this back into the middle road more. Mm -hmm. Let us not think that uh, the narrow value of getting audiences is the only value. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, if you think about it, I think that if program people uh, didn't go for the shortest cuts to get audience audiences, they might well find if they said, let's worry about good programs and see if that brings us in audiences, mm -hmm. they might actually find that their audiences have improved because of that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you've talked about India's uh, unending journey. Have you thought about your unending journey and, I, and the directions it might take? Uh, <laughs> at, at the at the age of 71, <laughs> I have to think about the end of my journey. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I can't, I can't <laughs> conclude this program without sort of the implicit endorsement that, you know, we had on our conversation, uh, you know, driving here, <laughs> that you now watch Dudashan News, and, and you prefer that over the other channels. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm, now, I'm now going to get slaughtered by, the, by all the other channels. Sorry, well, but that's a risk I you do, can afford to take. I do watch, <laughs> I haven't come here to publicize Dudashan, but uh, I did say that too in the car, yes. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank this you. has been a wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>